Hey there, wildlife warriors. Get ready for the Conservationist Assembled podcast, where we team up with the planet's mightiest defenders to learn about the diverse species and landscapes that make our world so amazing. If you're new to wildlife advocacy or an expert in wildlife conservation, this is the podcast for you. Today's episode is all about the Wildcats Conservation Alliance, an organisation focused on the crucial conservation of some of the world's wildcats. And here to tell us about the history of the Wildcats Conservation Alliance, the amazing work they're supporting, and the support they get to provide their crucial work, it's Esther Conway. Esther, thank you for joining us on today on the podcast. How's it going? Very well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me to speak to you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you, and I'm thrilled to hear that you're, you're doing well. Uh, so here we're today to discuss all things Wildcats Conservation Alliance and, and the species that, that you're helping. Uh, but before we get started, Esther, could you please just introduce yourself and, and let our listeners know who you are? Yeah, so I'm Esther Conway, and I manage the Wildcats programme, Wildcats Conservation Alliance. Uh, it's based at ZSL. Um, the Zoological Society of London um, and uh, I've been working on this programme since 2007, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago <laughs> when I started and I took over the management of the whole pro- programme in 2010. Fantastic, so yeah, uh, could you tell us about the Wildcats Conservation Alliance, it's, it's kind of brief history and, and- yeah, what the projects and species that they're they're striving to pr- support. Oh. Sure. Uh, Wildcats Conservation Alliance as a name came about in 2018, but the initiative itself goes back all the way to 1997. Uh, it was a time when very few zoos were directly involved in field conservation, but there were field programmes definitely desperately needing funds um, and Sarah Christie one of the early members of SL's conservation department and uh, an ex-keeper came up with a plan to encourage zoos to fund conservation projects and established 21st century tiger as a, a granting initiative so in in 2018 so it's jumping quite a way forwards 21st Century Tiger merged with the AMA Leopard and Tiger Alliance, which was initially set up as a kind of an alliance of about 13 NGOs. Um, And that was also managed out of ZSL. um, And it was funding uh, critically endangered leopard conservation. And then it also evolved, uh, this is ALTA, um, as it was known, also sort of evolved into um, working with tigers as well because of the overlapping habitat. And by joining these two funds together, we formed the newly newly named uh, Wildcats Conservation Alliance at um, uh, ZSL with our partner Dreamwell Wildlife Foundation, which is based out of an Australian zoo, um, with a mission to save wild tigers and amur leopards for future generations by raising awareness and funds for carefully chosen conservation projects. So essentially, we receive financial contributions from zoos and wildlife parks, but also from members of the public and uh, small corporates um, around the world. And by pooling this money together, we're able to use that to offer grants to ammo leopard and uh, wild tiger conservation projects across five countries in Asia. So it's a kind of win-win for the projects um and the zoos it's a win for the projects um because uh you know they receive the grant and it's a win for the zoos as we kind of then help them tell a conservation story we provide them with regular updates reports photos blogs they can contact us for up to date um you know leopard numbers tiger numbers um anything that they need and as we're a zoo-based program ourselves 
we help to showcase that um, zoo conservation um, or zoo contributions to conservation it, are really so significant and and probably a lot of people don't realize that and they come in 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 lots of different forms they could come in financial contributions to a fund like us and also their active own conservation projects and so it does help to tell that story so a hundred percent of the contributions that we receive from the zoos um, go directly to the projects we fund. Um, we can do this because of an annual grant that we get from Dream World Wildlife Foundation that covers the cost of our salaries and then um, uh, and also our expenses. And while um, ZSL then provides all of our sort of overall um, operational support and infrastructure and together they're able to it's able to mean that we can um, not take overheads from these uh, zoo contributions which is really important. So when we renamed as um, Wildcats Conservation Alliance we chose it because it wasn't associated with either uh, tigers or ammo leopards. It gave us the opportunity maybe in the future to expand into other um, species. So we kind of future proofed our name, but at the moment and, and, and for the foreseeable future, we are very much focused on ammo leopards and um, tiger subspecies. So why uh, there are still fewer than 5,000 wild tigers left. And, and people are always shocked to hear that. Um, they assume that there are, you know, many more thousands. Um, they are still being impacted by uh, habitat uh, fragmentation and degradation. They um, are still being poached across all of their ranges. And over the last uh, sort of 70 years, really, they've lost so much of their habitat that it's thought that there's only about three or 4% of their historical range left for them. And that is really significant. And the ammo leopard is in an even more perilous state, of course, because there's only around 100 left in the wild. And it's only really been, I suppose, in the past 12 years as science and technology has really begun to play a big part in uh, conservation. And the extent of the biodiversity crisis has been recognised that national and international and local governments have, have really started to play a bigger role in conservation. Um, but sadly for the tiger, um, some countries that realisation has come way too late. So, in, you know, the Indo-Chinese tiger is now extinct in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Laos, um, and the South China tiger has disappeared as well. And it, uh, the Chinese now only have the, the, the northern um uh, subspecies that is the ammo that is coming across from um, the Russian Far East. So both of those species really need our support. And you mentioned how Wildcats is is supporting the projects across you know multiple different countries in in terms of, of funding. How does Wildlife Wildcats sorry then select which project is going to fund because it was presumably there are you know a fair number of projects and, and sure. as much as we'd like to to be able to fund them all and um, yeah so could you please tell us a little bit more about that process so wildcats is we're only a small team um and so we work mostly with conservation projects that we already know currently we don't actually offer an open call for proposals due to just the the huge amount of work 
that would be involved. The projects we work with have to have a good track record uh, at conducting impactful activities that contribute to, you know, achievable objectives that are aiming to make a really long term difference to the to the species. Um, all of the proposals that we receive are peer reviewed by independent specialists um, who score the projects against a set criteria. And that's really important for us. Um, and this helps us. Um, this helps us assess the proposals for scientific credibility uh, to have objectives that are actually achievable and to use measurable outputs um, so that we can actually see progress in the projects. So we then have a, a mixed group of ZSL and non-ZSL conservationists who discuss the results of the reviews and this panel then helps choose um, the um, appropriate uh, proposals from those projects. Sometimes it results in us going back to the pro projects and actually saying, um, can we have more information? Could you change this bit? Um, and we have an open dialogue with those um, uh, projects to um, uh, request that we get the best value for for the money that we're giving. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, in, then in a roundabout sense or a, a cyclical nature, by assessing and, and kind of selecting which projects you're, you're going to fund, by having those those criteria, it helps improve the standard of, of the projects that that are applying in a sense and, and so that can only be seen as a good thing. Absolutely, absolutely um, and by using uh, uh, the peer reviewers they especially um, spe specialists maybe bringing in somebody who might be more of an educational specialist rather than a conservationist they can look at some of the activities that are planned and suggest ways that they might be improved. And so, you know, we're able to um, bring in those uh, people to help us uh, really define a really uh, clear project. Fantastic. And and you mentioned obviously about kind of future proofing the name for mm. you know maybe the, the potential to branch out into other species uh later on in, in time. But going forward, what are wildcats trying to achieve? So actually that's that's a really good question. We are currently developing our next five year strategy, uh revisiting e exactly that. What are we trying to achieve? So we're looking at our vision and our mission and how we select our projects, how our activities contribute to uh, the Global Tiger Recovery Plan, Sustainable Development Goals, Global Biodiversity Framework, etc. Um, so, so we are revisiting um, a whole heap of uh, our activities to make sure that we're as efficient and as forward looking as possible. Having said that, our goal will continue to be contributing to the survival of wild tigers and ammo leopards by funding impactful conservation projects. Yeah, and, and so in terms of, of the, the achievements, to, to date then, what are some of the biggest achievements of wildcats across its existence? Wow. Um, one of our biggest achievements, and there have been plenty, um, was going right back to the early days when 21st Century Tiger managed the IASA, um Tiger campaign. And it was the first uh, campaign that ran for two years. 
um, this was, gosh, this was back in 2002 and 2003, so many years ago. And it raised over 750,000 euros um, through EASA alone. So uh, that, that was one of our really early successes. Um, one of the key things that, um, that what I'm really proud of is that uh, both through Alta and 21st Century Tiger, we provided funds that helped established the smart monitoring software across tiger range countries obviously we weren't the only funder of that but we like to think we played our part in helping to institutionalize this really important tool for conservation and our projects continue to use it uh, right up to this day and i suppose on a more recent note um the launch of the wildcats professional development award last year was pretty cool for us um it's helping to build expertise uh for young and up and coming uh conservationists for the future fantastic yeah it's certainly um you know uh something to, to take very importantly is, is inspiring the next generation of, of conservationists so yeah i can see why that would be a huge achievement and, and something you'd want to, to shout about so you mentioned previously about how you don't have any any overheads as a, as a result of zsl and, and dream world and so what other factors have contributed to the the successes of wildcats um i think Having access to scientists and scientific knowledge by here at ZSL in a room full of conservation or conservation practitioners and managers, having the Institute of Zoology just across the road full of scientists and researchers is such an amazing um, uh, help for us. Uh, yeah, I can't overstate how important it is. Um, to be surrounded by um, people who are coming up with amazing new ideas and ways to reach out and save uh, wildlife across the planet. Yeah, definitely a, a very great resource to have and, and certainly our listeners should, should check that out. So what actions then need to happen to help improve the work of wildcats? Well, that, that, that's kind of an easy one. We'd like even more zoos to uh, contribute to our work. Um, you know, the, the zoos that hold tigers and, and ammo leopards. Um, and also to for their contributions to, um, to help all subspecies of tigers. Uh, zoos quite like the idea that they, if they hold Sumatrans, they'd like to support Sumatran con conservation if they hold amers they want to support you know uh, work going on in china but there are other subspecies that need help that aren't held by uh, within the um, breeding programs and we would love to see uh, the needs of of all tigers um uh you know helped by by zoo contributions um and it, we'd love to um expand the our portfolio of projects if we, if we were getting more money we could be working in um, other countries and and working with other ngos currently uh, our funds assist four of the tiger subspecies uh, we would love to expand that to include the malayan tiger which you know really is in need of help so yeah yeah i suppose it does come down to the kind of if if zoos aren't housing a certain species they can't provide any value um, and that's, that's certainly not true as, as you've mentioned so how can everybody get involved with wildcats conservation ethic even if they aren't directly involved with working around these species well i mean the zoos and you know members of the public are already doing a lot and um, you know we can't do what we do without them um 
for, for zoos, what would be great is if they were thinking about communicating species conservation outside of just the sort of international animal days. Um, we have a raft of information that can be shared to zoo visitors. Um, and, you know, it, it would be great for there to be more um, joined up comms about the species that are being supported by by zoos um yeah I, I know there are an awful lot of species held in the zoos that um you know all all need their equal chance of being um being promoted being talked about especially with regards to their what their conservation in the wild um and um yeah it, it I think moving away from just thinking about the anim international animal days would be a really good way forwards. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, there's definitely, like say, a mountain of work that needs doing um, and, and hopefully that's the direction that that modern conservation is, is certainly going in. Uh, so mm. Esther, thank you for, for giving us uh, an insight into to the background and, and the function of, of the wildcats. Conservation Alliance. So we're just going to switch gears a little bit and, and learn a little bit about yourself. So, yeah, please tell our listeners about yourself and give us an insight into your background and, and your journey to where you are now. So I don't actually have a conservation background and I came into the role precisely because of that. Um, I actually have a degree in history uh, and a background in management and administration. And this role is, it's about grant management, managing budgets, uh, it's about stakeholder relations, whether that's donors or project implementers, and it's not a hands-on conservation role. And so um, in the past, uh, conservationists taking on the role of this the, the role of working with wildcats would not stay very long because they um, they wanted to get out into the field. Um, so I came to this role really with very little knowledge of um, of of practical conservation act action, but I had a big interest in wildlife. Um, I always have done. I I grew up around animals. So I've had to learn the um, the, the the technical and science um, language and uh, um, and depth along the way, and I suppose that is one of the reasons why I so love being surrounded by all these scientists and conservationists because if i don't know something and that that's often the case i know <laughs> there are people who do know how to you know um assess uh, uh whether whether a, a conservation project is um is, is doing what what it what it should be doing so yeah um that's uh, really helpful um so yeah that that's my background and then when did you know that, that, that kind of did you just fall into the role like say you you came to the role exactly because mm. of of not having a conservation background but were you actively seeking no i i literally um was in the right place at the at the at the right time i mean as i say i i started working on this program back in 2007 my kids had started at school i was looking to go back into the workplace i lived locally to the zoo they were looking for somebody uh with strong uh, um uh, management and administrative skills and i started uh, only on a two day a week uh, work, which was brilliant at the time for me, easing back into work. Um, so, yeah, uh, there is opportunities. There are opportunities for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. What advice would you give to someone maybe that's not from a conservation background, but, you know, these roles that certainly don't just need conservation experience they need kind of the other things so what kind of advice would you give to someone that's maybe looking for that transition 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as, as I say, a career in conservation doesn't mean going out into the field and being hands on. Conservation needs so many skills, marketing, um, policy specialists, people who can who can advocate with high level governments, um, legal, you know, all conservation teams need to understand the legalities of working in a country um and um you know we need technical experts we also need uh, it specialists people who can code there are so many opportunities now to have a, a you know to to make your um impact in conservation and in in wildlife and you know you don't have to even if you want to be a field conservationist, you know, you don't have to go overseas. There is so much. And in fact, it's it's really important to to get that. You you there is so much that needs to be done within our own country um, on on uh, on our native species and habitat restorations. And you know. It, it's not about going overseas anymore. It is very much about looking at our own environment uh, that is is really important. Um, and if I was a young person training as a as a field conservationist now, that's what I would be focusing on. What 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 needs to be done at home? Yeah, very poignant uh, point to make there, and and kind of. We know that that people working within the zoo sector or, or out in the field, there isn't really a, a typical day. And if you just listed off, you know, a huge range of, of tasks that you and, and other people within a conservation organisation have to do. So is there a typical day for you or kind of what does a typical day look like if there is such a thing? <laughs> um, no, there isn't a typical day for me at all. Um so my day can uh, change from writing reports to uh, uh, write, present, doing a presentation, so putting a PowerPoint together. Um, it could be uh, talking to people either face-to-face -face or via uh, Zoom. Every day is different. Um, and, and that's one of the things I love about it. I mean, I go from doing the the accounts one day to um, to 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 writing a piece for uh, a blog, um, yeah, it, it's 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 that is a, what the wonder of the job. And and with that, the kind of love of of the diversity of your tasks. Is there any particular part of your role that you enjoy above any other? I think talking to people. I love meeting young people so talking to school kids about conservation about biodiversity about about just being green in their lives about recycling and um reusing things and not consuming so much uh i love um just being able to talk to the public at the at zoos about the wildlife and why it's really important that we that we've got these wildlife in our zoo. Um, you know, I think there's still so many people who who um, haven't been to a zoo for so long. They 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 have very old views about what a zoo um, is like because they haven't visited it in many years. And it's really lovely to actually hear people go, oh, my goodness, it's so different from when I was a child. And just to be able to talk to them about how important conservation is now within the zoo community. Um, it, it, it's, it, yeah, I, talking to people is what I love best. Yeah, I certainly agree with that as well. Uh, it's great to, to have those meaningful conversations. So in terms now of what Wildcats can do for you, because you, you're, you're obviously doing a lot for the organisation and, and by process um, species conservation. But is there one lesson you'd say that working for Wildcats has taught you? Um, 
that we that we can all do our bit to make the world a better place. Uh, so I think a lot of people feel impotent that they can't make a difference because the the biodiversity crisis, the 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 um, climate change crisis, everything feels so out of control. But I think that having worked and been in the conservation community for this many years, we can make a difference and everyone can make a, a difference themselves personally in the way they live their lives. And I think that's something that I, you know, that I feel is really important. Fantastic. Yeah. So Esther, thank you for, for kind of sharing your your journey and your experience with us. Uh, just to finish up the episode, we're going to finish on some some lighthearted, just some fun questions. So are there any dream species that you'd love to see in the wild? <laughs> um, so probably the ammo leopard uh, would be the one animal that I would love to see in the wild but that's probably not going to happen even those working out into the in the field uh, rarely ever get to see these elusive animals especially as there's so few of them left they might get to see them on their camera traps but that's about it but that would be amazing and, and how about then countries or continents that you'd love to visit is there anywhere that you'd like to journey to well, on the similar theme, I've never been to India. I know it's strange, but I've never been to India and I would love to go to India. And it is one of the only places that you have a chance of seeing a tiger in the wild. So, yeah, I want to go to India. Yeah, I get that. Um, I certainly I think there's a reason why it's there. Uh dubbed a subcontinent i think that just the diversity that you'd see out there would be incredible um, along with tigers and um, if you could be an animal wester what would it be and, and why oh gosh um do you know what i thought i i i thought about this because you you did tell me about the, this question ahead of time and <laughs> what yeah um what animal would i love to be do you know what I would quite like to be a migratory bird. Yeah. I'm not a bird person. I mean, I you know, I love the wildlife in my garden and I feed the birds and, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I can identify birds. But I, I, the idea of being a migratory bird and seeing the world from up high and seeing the differences and being in you know and having an aim and going there um i think that would be pretty special yeah i love that that's a, a great way of looking at it and um, not necessarily the species they, themselves but just the the lifestyle I, I, yeah i get that i mm -hmm. appreciate that so when you're not working how do you keep busy uh, well, um, I have a dog, so I spend a lot of time walking the dog. I um, I love gardening. Um, I love reading and I sing in a choir. So I like to sing. Uh, and yeah, that pretty much keeps me busy. Fantastic. And, and so how can our listeners keep up to date with the work of, of Wildcats? So the one of the best things to do is to visit our website, conservewildcats.org, and to sign up for our newsletter. It's a really good way of finding out what we've been doing and what our plans are and to hear about the conservation that we're uh, funding. If those people are from um, a, a zoo background, we have a special zoo focused newsletter that people can sign up to which includes some more sort of uh, zoo focused information that is quite useful for people so if they want to sign up for that they can get in touch with me and uh, join our mailing list and yeah um, keep a watch out for what events we're attending 
and uh, come and say hi. Fantastic. And have you got any events coming up? Um, so only uh, a zoo focused event, zoo focused uh, com conferences, etc. BRs, ERs, um, the AZA, uh, fill it tag. So, yeah. Oh, amazing. I'm sure some of our listeners will be looking out for those. And what is one thing that you think our listeners should take away from today's episode? Live your best life um, and support Wildcats Conservation Alliance. Fantastic. So, yeah, with that, Esther, you have answered my last question. So a massive shout out for, for gracing the podcast and, and putting the spotlight on the incredible work of the Wildcats Conservation Alliance and the projects they seek to support. Uh, we also really appreciate you keeping us enlightened on how we can all contribute towards their future. So we wish you and the, the Alliance all the best in, in the rest of, of your projects and we'll be sure to keep up to date with the development. That's all from the Conservationist Assembled podcast this week. Thanks a million for tuning in. Follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Conservationist Assembled Pod to stay connected to the latest updates. And hey, if you found this episode as amazing as I did, be sure to like, share and leave a five star review. This helps us spread the word and bring you more conservation heroes with their fascinating stories. Thanks team, and catch you all next time.